Hello and welcome to the Inner Sanctum's newest footy podcast. This is The Hard Tag, where we get up close and personal with the biggest names in footy. Uh, I'm your host, Jackson Batoli, and I'm here along with my good friend, Brando. Brando? How are you? Uh, very good, thank you. And our third great host, uh, Kristen Sims, unfortunately, is a laid out today. We're sending her, her our thoughts, but she'll be back with us next week. Uh, talking about the biggest names in football, it doesn't come much bigger than that. Uh, Brad Ottens, not only thank you for not only being a, uh, get hosting us today, being with us today, but uh, being our first guest. Uh, thanks for joining us. No worries, Jackson. Thanks for having me, mate. Thanks, mate. Um, 245 games, 261 goals, mark of the year, and three premierships. It's a bloody good career, but we're not interested in that right now. What we want to know to start with, what is your favourite junior sporting moment? Uh, oh, that's, um, that's a good question. Oh, I, um, I, played, I didn't play a huge amount of footy when I was really little. I, was, I only really started playing footy. Um, when I went to boarding school. So I, I played soccer as a kid and we won, I remember we won a premiership. Um, we, we called ourselves the junior Juventus, I think we were called. And um, we won the premiership at about the age, I must have been about six or seven. Um, and I've still got the medal there somewhere. And, and that was a, that was probably a, the earliest memory of, of, of sporting, a, you know, great, of a fun sporting achievement as a kid. So I'll probably go with that one. Very good. I guess this is episode one, so we'll get ours out there as well. Brando, have you have you got one there? Um, I wasn't very good at footy when I was younger, so I don't have many um, great stories, but I remember my first goal. Um, ironically, I don't remember a lot of it. I don't remember the ball going through, but I remember picking it up and just throwing it on my left boot and everyone got around me. And um, yeah, that was that's probably my best moment, my first goal. Um, but yeah, what do you got, Jacko? Um, I'm sensing a lot of you and I weren't very good at footy as kids. Um, I've got a few favourites. I was carried to a premiership when I was in under 15s, but my favourite of all is my first season of footy, my very first game. I think it was under under eights or under nines and my very first shot at goal. I would have gotten a free kick in the goal square. I'm lining it up. Everything's all well and good. And then I think I'm pretty sure I kick it as high as the goal post, but it doesn't make the distance. It comes straight back down. So that's... <laughs> That's my one. That's about my extent of footy. Into a strong, um, though, Jackson. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was pretty good. It's um, it's one of those ones. That's pretty much how my footy career went. And then happy to put that behind me. So you said you know you didn't start playing footy until uh you know later on in your junior career. So because that was you grew up in a farm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, as a kid, well, we were we lived in Catherine, which is sort of just south of Darwin for sort of my early childhood, and then um. Then about the time I would have started getting into probably all all the you know all the sports, we moved out to a cattle station which was further south of, of Catherine. It was quite remote. It was about four hours south of Catherine. So yeah, there wasn't a wasn't a huge um yeah the availability to sport probably wasn't there for me as a young kid until until later on and I went went away to boarding school and got into all the sporting then. So yeah, we grew up it was quite remote when I was a, when I was a young kid. Yeah, cattle farmers, geez. How far away, how isolated were you out there? And I guess you, your childhood would have been mostly just, you know, normal standard kid stuff outside on the motorbikes, you know, chasing yeah. stuff. Oh, well, we were a long way. As I said, Catherine was probably our nearest main town. That was four four hours. We were four hours south of that. There was a there was a couple of smaller towns where we'd go, um, which were probably an hour, hour and a half drive to get groceries and, um, you know, mail and all that sort of thing. So... Yeah, we were we were a long way from anything. I did a, I did school on um, via correspondence on the radio. I used to get on the radio every morning and speak to the teacher, and might be able to hear a couple of other kids from around the northern, you know, not top end of the northern territory somewhere. And mum was my school teacher. We um we had a school had a classroom set up in the house, and and um, we we do school via correspondence. And um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a different way of growing up. Great, great as a kid, you know, riding motorbikes and horses and. You know, out working with with the old man a lot, and and um, so yeah, it was a quite a bit of a different different upbringing, but it was it was it was great fun as a young as a young kid. Yeah, absolutely, I guess. And then you moving to boarding school. When when did that come along? Uh, well, year year eight. It was back in those days. To it started at, um, year eight, so I must have been thirteen, I guess. And um, you know, you couldn't you couldn't really do high school 
via correspondence the way I was we were doing at primary school. So, you know, the kids all we all just knew that we had to go away to boarding school eventually. And um yeah, year year eight came around and we all you know, you sort of I went finished up in Adelaide to going to boarding school and um yeah, that was a tough change, a bit of a culture shock moving from the from the bush out in down to a big city and, you know, a long way from home. But um yeah, as I said, exposed to footy and all of yeah, you, know, you just become sport just becomes your life, and that was that's where the passion for footy probably started. Yeah, because you like I said, you know, going from so remote to being in a boarding school, you'd be around people constantly. What'd you, I guess, how'd you keep yourself busy, and then eventually that leading into football? Yeah, I, I found it really hard. It was you know I was, got really homesick to start with, and because um, you're just so far from home, you don't you can't. A lot of the other kids could go home, you know, for weekends and that sort of thing. Whereas I was. I was, um, you know, I found that it was quite, it was, it was pretty tough. You sort of learn, learn a, a lot of independence pretty quickly. You sort of have to, but um, there is a lot of, you've got your mates around you the whole time. You know, boarding school's a, an amazing environment. you just got someone to pick the footy with or play tennis with, or, you know, go down the cricket nets or something. And, um, you know, it, it was pretty soon, as I said, sport just became became sort of the thing that you did outside if you weren't at school you were kicking a footy or, or playing tennis or something and um and that sort of that was something that I just I just loved and and that's and body school pretty soon became a, just a place where you know it was just a lot of fun to be around and you know had it wasn't wasn't all bad you had all your food cooked for you and washing was done for you and everything you had your mates around you all the time so once once you sort of got used to that initial culture shock it was pretty good fun in the end yeah, like you said, not not a whole lot of school work going on, a lot of lot of sport, a lot of just getting through the days, huh? That's it. Yeah, that's it. Um when how did you I guess get into get into footy particularly then? And then what age did you sort of figure out that, you know, hang on, I can I could probably do this. I'm pretty all right at this. Yeah, well, I was always interested in footy. My my dad played for Sturt in South Australia and he was he was quite a you know, he had it played in a couple of premierships with Sturt and um had had quite a successful career, um, and so I sort of followed. You know, I was all I grew up knowing a lot about footy and being pretty keen on footy, just with with his with his involvement. And often, you know, people would talk to him about it. And um, so I was sort of, I guess, that planted the seed a little bit for me, even though I didn't play much as a kid. But um, really, know what I was doing. But um, you know, year eight. I think I reckon about halfway through year nine, the year nine season, I sort of started to work out that I was, you know, I was always pretty tall, and um, you know, I just sort of worked out that it was, you know, it was sort of something that I loved, and and I was getting, I was getting better, and I sort of felt like I was, I was as good as the other kids, and then eventually, as I, as I got older, I probably sort of worked out that it was something that I was, I was reasonably good at, and um, by the time I was sort of in year year eleven, I guess I was, that was when I was starting to play a little bit more representative footy and playing state footy and stuff and um and the and the, the reality of maybe maybe making a career out of it might have been might have become a bit bit more realistic. So um yeah, slowly progressed from a from a you know, obviously not having a huge background in it as a young kid, but as a once I got into it, I pro- probably progressed through pretty quick. Yeah. Without yeah. jumping ahead too much, you and your brother were both pretty big cats fans was there any sort of team any player particularly you sort of modeled your game after i wanted to replicate out on the field uh i remember having i remember loving obviously love gaz senior they was you know he was just he could i couldn't yeah he was he was probably my hero as a kid um and I'll obviously jumping forward ahead. I'll never forget the first time I met him in the rooms. You know, he came into the rooms, obviously playing alongside little Gaz, and um, saw saw Gaz Senior walk in, and I just couldn't speak. I basically just just fan had my fan moment, and just couldn't. I just couldn't stop looking at him. And um, you know, I was I, I knew you know obviously coming to Geelong, I knew I'd cross paths with him at some stage, but it was. Um, it was a pretty amazing moment just to meet the, meet your, the idol of your childhood, you know, in the foot, in your footy room. So that was pretty special. But um, John Barnes was another one that I, I sort of grew up, you know, admiring as a as a Cats fan. I, I played a fair bit in the ruck as a kid, and always played in the ruck, I guess. And so he was um, he was one that I admired, and and was lucky enough to play against him a few times as well, which was always which was always a bit of a thrill. So um, 
Barry Stone was another one that I used to love watching and big, big, strong mark. They came to Darwin one year and I remember remember going to the rooms and um, seeing these these huge men and they, I was just blown away by the size of them. And and as I said, yeah, and I was lucky enough not not that long after that to, to play against a few of those guys that I was lucky enough to meet when they came to Darwin that time. So, yeah, it was, it was a few few of those players that was obviously a very successful team back in those days and the in the 90s and yeah we grew up loving watching the cats so i was, felt very lucky to be able to finish up playing with them for sure yeah 100 percent. and obviously with um you being picked two in the 1997 draft what kind of expectations were set on you by the club not only by the club but by yourself as well uh yeah i mean it's number two is funny you sort of i guess you know the top 10 top 10 you sort of there is a certain amount of expectation i i think you probably the clubs are clubs are always been pretty good. They were, Richmond was good at you know trying to limit that as as much as possible, and um, you know. But I think number one, you've got all of all of the weight of the world on your shoulders. But all but number two probably has has a lot more time to a bit more grace to try and to take the time to develop and get. Everyone expects to pick number one to come in and be flying, whereas the rest of us sort of had a bit more time. So um, I was probably pretty lucky going to Richmond where. Um, you know where I wasn't. Where I was probably getting games when I probably shouldn't have been because you know Richmond had sort of been a little bit down down the ladder back in those days. So um, I was lucky enough to get a, probably a lot more games early in my career than what I probably deserved to play, and that probably helped a lot in my in my early early development. Mm-hmm. Um, just before Jabrino goes into sort of Richmond, there the, also in that draft, obviously the top ten was so good. I think they all played a hundred games to get picked up. I think your brother got picked up that draft as well late. How was that? That must have been a great night for the family, just in general. Yeah, it was. It was great. Uh, you know, my brother had been in the draft for he was twenty one, I think. Um, so he'd sort of been overlooked a couple of times, and um, he did quite a good year. That we both played senior footy in 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 Adelaide that year together, and um, you know, there was a few clubs that had sort of been been sort of showing a bit of interest in both of us. So, um, by the you know by the time the draft came around, I was pretty pretty confident I was going to get picked up and I was just, I just hoped, I was just hoping that he would get dra- get drafted too. And so, yeah, but he's, he came around, I think pick 50, I think he, he went. So um, yeah, when he got picked up and finished up, obviously Melbourne picked him up. So knew that we were going to be moving to Melbourne together. And um, that was probably a, a bit of a relief too, that I wasn't going to go on my own. And um, so yeah, it was, that was pretty special to be able to, we lived together. He, he was four years on the list at, at Melbourne. So we, we, we lived together that whole time and mum finished up moving over together with us. So yeah, we sort of basically um, packed up house and all moved together all at once to Melbourne. So it was, um it was pretty ideal really for a young kid to, to move into state with his whole family at, at that time was, was, was pretty special. Did it help? Like, did it help the move? Because you hear a lot about players getting homesick or whatnot when they get drafted in a state. But having your home, whole family must have really been, I guess, helpful in that transition. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, we just, you know, we all we rented a house together, and um, you know, it was when we were living pretty much together in Adelaide anyway. So um, yeah, it, it was definitely, you know, you couldn't really script a better transition from moving moving into state to for you for your footy career to start with with your, with your brother there with you and, and your mum as well cooking cooking and cleaning for you and um you know so I was yeah we were, we were very lucky it was it was it was um it was the perfect setup really 100 percent. so um obviously first game of your career was round one 1998 against Essendon what was it like running out in front of such a massive crowd what feelings do you remember from that night yeah, I, I remember being really overwhelmed by the crowd. You know, it was seventy. I think it was seventy or eighty thousand there that night, and mm-hmm. um, and it was, yeah, it was. I mean, it, it, I, I was probably, I was probably a bit naive to really appreciate, you know, how how lucky I was to be playing in round one against Essen and to Richmond. And I sort of, you know, I look back on it now and think think how fortunate. I was to be able to play for a club like Richmond. They always played in big, in front of big crowds, and um, you know those big, big Melbourne clubs. It, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing experience to be a part of them in in general. But to to be able to play in those big games and um, to have one in my first game was it was just yeah. I remember I think Geish came to me. Jeff Geish was the coach, and 
he said to me at halftime, stop looking at the crowd and start playing footy. So I must have been I must have been a bit caught up in the crowd because I was just couldn't <laughs> young kid from Northern Territory growing up. I probably hadn't seen that many people all in one place before. So um I was a I was a little bit sort of um yeah, a little bit overwhelmed to to begin with. I, I think I don't think I did a huge amount in the game, but you know, we we it was quite a close game. We won we won in the end and that was um it was a really fond memory of my career was that that first game and you know, you just get a you get a taste of of what those big games are, and in your first one, it's pretty special. Do you remember who the first player you matched up on was? Uh, I remember rocking against Stephen Alessio at one stage. He was and he was probably weighed probably twice as much as I did at, at that time in in my career. So I remember thinking, standing across the centre bounce, thinking, Jesus, Blake's going to break me in half. Um, I think. I think Paul Salmon might have even been playing for for Essendon too at that stage. So I played, I was rucking against him, and Dustin Fletcher was was playing on him up forward. And these are all, you know, you sort of the guys that you you grow up. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't a huge footy footy head, at, you know, before I got drafted. But I remember just watching the footy on a Friday night, and they were the ones that the, they're these guys you you see on telly, and then you are expected to play alongside them. And you know, as an eighteen year old, it was a bit of bit mind blowing, but. Um, yeah, there's a yeah. Stephen Alessio just stood out to me. He was like a he was a mountain mountain of a man. So it was it was a big it was a big challenge as a young kid. Yeah, absolutely. And then jumping forward a bit, you in two thousand one, you absolutely dominated the, the pies, I think. And then Mick Malthouse comes out and says you're the best player in the game. What what's that like as when an opposing coach says something like that to you? Uh yeah. The, I mean, there was probably I don't know. I found that. Early on in my career, I felt like, you know, there's the expectations are low. So you sort of, when you exceed anyone, anyone's expectations, everyone thinks you're going great and, you know, and, you, and you're doing it easy. And then, um, but then when, when the expectations grow, that's when I found the pressure came on and um, it was almost easier when you're younger because no one really expected much of you. And when you did well, it was, you know, it was great. And when you didn't do well, it was because you were young and you had, you had excuses, but um, yeah, as you as you go through, you sort of you know you set a bit of a standard for yourself, and you know for yourself as much as what other people set for you, and um, and it becomes you know the footy becomes probably a little bit more difficult then when people are expecting you to do it all the time, and that's probably something that I've found a bit challenging at times, and um, you know finding that consistency and stuff was was something that probably was probably one of the biggest challenges I found in my career was. You know, I, I knew I was, I was, I could, I could, I knew I was, I was pretty handy when I could get going, but I was, I think the the weight of expectation probably, I probably didn't manage that all that well. So, um, yeah, early on it was, you know, the, early on the development seemed to come along reasonably consistently because, you know, I, I was fit and I didn't get injured a lot when I was younger. So that always helped. And um, yeah, I don't know, I was, I was lucky to, to string a few games together early on too. And that, I think that helped my development a bit. Um, yeah. And then you finish that season with an all Australian blazer. How, I guess, what's that? The fourth season, that must be an incredible feeling. I mean, do you, do you still have it? Or do you remember what that was like? Well, we didn't, we didn't get a blazer back oh, then. Um, no, you didn't. Oh. Did you? They, that only started the late to late two thousands. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Quite recent. Oh. Yes. You got a little, little glass award, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've still got that somewhere that I try and I try and keep the kids away from that from breaking it. Um, <laughs> not that it's not the most kid friendly trophies, those ones. But um, yeah, I remember there was Darren Gasper was was picked that year. I think Joel Bowden might have been in the team that year as well. And um, yeah, it was it was a really proud sort of moment for me. I guess it was it was a really successful um, year for the club. It was the first time we played finals in in a long time and. Um, you know, we were, we'd had a really finished fourth and we'd had a really good year. And, um, there was a lot of guys in that team that had played just, had just sort of most career best years. And it sort of lined up that we had a really consistent sort of strong season. We, we, we finished up being rolled by Brisbane in the, you know, and they, who went on to win, win the first of their three in a row. So it was a, you know, they were probably, we were probably a little bit off the mark as far as the premiership was concerned, but it was a, it was a really successful year for the club and that was that was something that Richmond hadn't had in a long time. And when I say it was great to play for Richmond, you know, you know, you feel very fortunate to have been able to play for such a 
big, strong traditional club. It was it was amazing to play for them in a year where we we played in finals and and you could just feel the momentum and the and the the passion and the of the supporters growing each week and you know obviously being starved of a lot of success and so to to be able to, you know even though we didn't we didn't obviously didn't win it, win the premiership we to play finals and to to have a year where you know the, all of a sudden the, the supporters could be proud of their club was was something pretty special i remember by the end of the year i think we played north melbourne later in the year and it was you know there was 70 odd thousand there and they were just you know then the tigers people when that you know we've all seen them when when they're up and going they're the most passionate people we ever come across and um, it was pretty special to ride that little bit of a wave of, of you know, of momentum was with, with you know, getting a few wins on the board and and having a pretty good year was was, was pretty special to be a part of. So yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a great memory for, of mine. Well, I bet it is. And you talk about um, making finals for the first time in a while and how passionate those supporters are. What was the build up like to that first qualifying final against Essendon then? Yeah, it was um, it was really interesting. We played them in round twenty two. And um and we beat them pretty convincingly, but it was you know by the end of the game we we're winning by a fair bit, and Kevin Sheedy started taking off all his best players, and um knowing that we were all gonna we we're gonna play again the next week, so there was a few mind games being played in round twenty two, and um as I said we we didn't hadn't played finals in so long, so there was you know the build up. Remember there was a lot of people at training, and um that that the week of that first I think it was a qualifying final or something it would have been, and um, and we played Essendon again, and um, they'd been talk all week that you know they disrespected us because they'd taken off all their good players in the week before, and there was a bit of yeah, you know, there was a lot, lot of. You, I mean, you just got this. I'd obviously played three years before that where we hadn't gone close to playing finals, and and so you sort of don't you don't have much of appreciation for what it's like, but you just the you know the the buzz around footy going into finals finals time is is um. It was something totally different to what I'd experienced up until that point in my career. So that was really, really fun to be a part of. And um, yeah, it was a, it was just obviously yeah, Essendon round in the first week of the finals it was quite a big crowd. And um, and unfortunately, we we just we probably didn't handle the the occasion all that well. We probably just the, the occasion probably got the better of us, and we 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 didn't play all that well that game and, and got rolled. So. Um, yeah, it was a little bit of a fizzer, but we we managed to have a win against Carlton the following week, which was which was Brandon would have probably remembered that one. But um, <laughs> no, it was um, you know, we were to we, another big huge game in front of a big crowd, you know, at the MCG to to get a win a win for Richmond in a final was pretty special, and then and then unfortunately got knocked over by Brisbane up there, you know, in the in the prelim, but. Um, yeah, it was it was a pretty successful year for Richmond. I reckon that was that was something pretty special considering the probably the eight or 10 years that had led up to that. Yeah. And one man who was a big part of that push and the momentum was um, the coach for the majority of your tenure at Richmond, the great man, the late great Danny Frawley. Um, what things stick out to you about the man he was? Uh, he was publicly, he was really, you know, he was a joker and he was, he was, um, you know, he was a, a Big personality. He was a lot of fun, and um, and people we all rem- remember Spud for that. But I think my my main memory, uh, you know, and of of him and my relationship with him was he was very warm and caring, and he was he was he was the sort of guy that he just if you're one of his sort of one of his people, and we you know, us us as players, he he just protected us, and and he did everything he could to to um you know he made you feel like he was. And we were very important to him, and he was, and he was great. He was just a great, um, he's a great club person because he, you just always knew that he was the one that was sort of looking out for you, and he was sort of led from the front in that respect. And he, you know, if anyone had a crack at you, or if he was, you know, he would, he took you under his wing, and he, and he protected all of us as players, and that was something I always, um, always. I think that really helped me as a young bloke. He, he became, he took. You know, he and I became really close, and he took you know he took me under his wing a lot, and um, and I think that really helped me as a player, helped me as a person a lot as well because he was you know he was he was he was he would protect me, but he was always hard, and he was always because he he put that effort in to to supporting you as a person and as a as a 
as a human being, he was able to have the hard conversations with you. And I never, and I always felt like I knew that it was coming from a, a good place. So yeah, really caring, really protecting and um, protective and um, passionate. He was a hugely passionate man. You know, you just knew if Spud was thinking something, you'd always knew, he, you know, he just, he just wore his heart on his sleeve and, um, yeah, they're the they're the um, the traits that I sort of always remember. Spud, remember Spud. Yeah, my dad always tells a story when he was a road worker, and um, when Spud was at Collingwood, he was doing work outside Victoria Park, and Spud comes out. He did not know my dad at all. Comes up, they have a chat, and he gave my dad a box of potatoes. Did not know mm. who he was, and that's a testament to the man that Spud was. Do you have any good Spud stories from when you were at Richmond? Uh, there's a few, yeah, there's a few. He was very, as I said, passionate. He would, he could give some of the best sprays you've ever heard in your life, you know, just through, just through, not through anger, but just through just pure passion. He just wanted us to to win and he wanted to win himself. And, um, I remember one, one week it was towards the end of, you know, he was under the pressure, under a fair bit of pressure. We, we'd lost a fair few and, it was getting to the end of that final year and I think it was 2004 and he, we'd lost a fair few. It was everyone, you know, the, the media as they tended to do with Richmond back in those days, a camp out the front of the, of the club and, you know, we'd have to walk into the club and there'd be video cameras and all sorts of stuff. And so we come into the club, we've lost, I don't know how many it was in a row. He's under, he's just under a hell of a lot of pressure. People were talking about him getting sacked any minute and, and um, we walk up into the meeting room and, and um, and it was the old, yeah, the old meeting room. It was the GR room, I think it was called. And, and uh, it was a tiny little room. We all packed in and we'd all, have, there was a video screen and we'd go through our, you know, post-game sort of meetings and whatever. And that's where most of the, the big conversations were had and the, the famous sp Spud sprays would happen. And so we're all sort of nervously sitting in the room waiting to, Spud walks in and, and we're all thinking, oh, just trying to, hoping that you weren't the target of one of his, you know, he wasn't going to get onto you first about, about what you did on the weekend or whatever. And um, he walks up the front, he's holding this pump in his hand, the, the pump that they'd used to pump up the the footies. And he's and the boys are thinking, looking at him, sizing it up, thinking just what's going on here. He walks up the front and with his, just holding this pump, he doesn't say anything, he's just holding this pump in his hand and and he just holds the pump over his head. And the boys are all thinking, oh, geez, Spud's lost it here. He's going to, what's he up? What's he going on about? He's about to go off his head or something. He's, you know, what's he getting at? He's, he's like, what am I, boys? He's got the pump over his head. And he's going, Greg Tivendale was in the front row. And he's like, Tiva, what am I? What am I, mate? And he's holding the pump over and he's, and Tiva's nervously, look, no one wants to look in the eye thinking they're going to, they might be on the receiving end of one of one of Spud's blow ups. And, and someone says, oh, you're under the pump, and he goes, I'm under the pump, aren't I? I'm under the pump, and he's holding this this air pump above his head. This compressed <laughs> pump, he's like, I'm under the bloody pump, aren't I? And the boys all <laughs> laughed, and it just sort of broke, it broke the you know it broke the tension of what was you know clearly a pretty tough time for everyone. He just and he cracks up laughing, and you know anyone who knows Spud, and he laughs, and his shoulders would go, and his shoulders would be hunched over, and and he just cracked up laughing, and the boys all laughed, and it took a bit of the pressure off, and we could. We could sort of get on with our week, which was which was wasn't going great at the time. But he just had a he had a funny knack of just being able to make it, you know, a tough situation sometimes be a bit lighter, with just with the, with the humorous side, which was always a great strength of his, I reckon. That is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Um, I guess coming from that as well, you a few years later, then you said end of two thousand and four. The move to Geelong. Now, if I'm correct, it wasn't that wasn't a sudden thing. It was sort of a mutual decision on the club's behalf. Can you talk us through that move at all? Well, yeah, well, it was at the end of that year actually. It was 04, um, Spud's Spud's fifth year. It was my seventh year at the club, and um, we finished up finishing last that year. And Spud, you know, had been, you know, Spud had been told he wasn't going to be coaching the team, but you know, he still he still committed to he got sacked but still coached out the last sort of handful of games because he said that's what he you know a lot of what I don't think it's ever I've never known a coach to do that since you know they get sacked and they just they walk out and, and there's a there's an interim coach but Spud Spud coached out the year and um 
obviously. And so, yeah, it was a tough, it was a really tough year that year. We finished, I think we finished last and, um, and I was coming out of contract at the same time and, um, and I wasn't playing great. I was sort of felt like I was, I was sort of my, my development and my sort of career had probably plateaued a little bit. And I felt like I was, I was probably, um, I probably needed, I needed something to change in my career. I felt like, I, you know, I needed, I really needed something to change. Otherwise that my career was probably, you know, in, in all likelihood could have probably just petered it out and, you know, I might have scratched out another 50 or 80 or 100 games, but I, I wasn't really setting any great, great standards. So um, I remember having some really good conversations with Spud, actually, you know, he'd obviously just been sacked and, and I was finding it difficult with, with where I sort of felt like I sat at Richmond and, and where my career was going, and and you know he, he gave me he, we had a, we had some really good good honest chats about what he thought where he thought I was at and what I, what he thought maybe I needed to do and chatted to a few few other had some really good chats with the manager and and then and I think and I remember having a chat um, with with Terry Wallace he was the incoming coach and and you know he was really positive we had a really positive conversation about how he sort of saw saw the me fitting in within Richmond still and um but ultimately I think I just I, I knew deep down I needed to I needed to make a change and I needed to probably you know I, I think I just needed a change of, of atmosphere really I, I didn't feel I just didn't feel like my career was really gonna gonna really progress by doing the same thing I felt like I just needed a different a real a real change and shake up in my life and so I, I, my manager said, "Look, you got to decide whether you want to come, whether you want to stay or go." And, I, and he said, "If you if you decide to go, you've just got to stick to it and say I'm going, and, I'll, and we'll work out where you finish up after that." And so we did that. I, I sort of just said to the club, I, "I think I want to leave, and I want to I want to try find you know find a different environment for myself." And um, and and then you know, luckily enough, Sydney Sydney were really keen. For me to go and play for them, I went and went and had a meeting with them up in Sydney and um, met some really good people and seemed you know they just finished they just won a uh, I think got beaten in a prelim you know that that year and so they were going quite well and I sort of could see myself living up there and also and Geelong was was another team that that you know invited me to come down and have a chat and so I went and had a chat with um with Cookie and Bomber um, and Wellesley at the time and. Um, and just you know, I don't know. It was sort of a, it was just a something felt pretty pretty right about Geelong. I, I, I'd spent a little bit of time down there. I'd lived with a guy from Geelong for a while, so up in Melbourne. So I used to spend weekends and that down there occasionally, and and I was a bit familiar with the town, and 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 sort of felt it seemed, sort of felt like my sort of place. And um, the club felt was was definitely an you know an up and coming club. There's a lot of young guys there who were, who were clearly going to be great players and. Um, and I felt like that was something somewhere I could have fitted in. And as far as where I was at, I was only 24 at the time, so I was, I was still pretty young myself. And um, yeah, so it was it was just a decision that you know, after having sat down with them to meet them, I just felt like that was where I wanted to be. And and that was the other advice my manager gave me. Dan Dan Richardson was my manager at the time, and he said, just you got to choose if you're going to leave, say you're going to leave, which which is what I did. And, and he said when you if you pick a club that you want to go to, you just got to pick that club and stick with it. And we just got to get the deal done. And so I, I just, I, that's exactly what we did. It's just said, I was told Geelong, I'd love to, you know, if, I'd love to come and play for them if, if they could, if they could get the deal done. And so that was the way it panned out. We went into the, into the trade week and just hoping that that, that could, that could get worked out. Cause back in those days, it was quite difficult for the trades to get done. It's probably not as simple as what it is these days for, for, players to move clubs so um yeah I, I um sat back and waited till the last two hours or something of trade week and and managed to they managed to get the deal done with, and Richmond did quite well out of it they got a couple of couple of good picks and um and Geelong had to give up a really good player in Brent Maloney to as part of that deal but um yeah I don't know it's sort of just it was it was a pretty pivotal part of my life because my life changed a lot for the better and around that time. And I felt like I just, it, it really suited me down to the ground. So I was really lucky the way it, way it panned out in the end. Before Brino takes you through sort of your time at Geelong, I would have loved to have you at Sydney, obviously, but was there just something in Geelong that felt um, 
obviously growing up in a remote town that had that sort of charm to it that it's a you know a bit a bit out of the city although it's a pretty big city itself but it's you know just a bit away from everything yeah absolutely jackson i think that was that was absolutely a, a factor in in that I, you know I, I clearly wanted to i really wanted to play for us in a successful team and i could see geelong was going to be a good a good team you know you, they were, there was huge raps on them they they just finished up. I think they'd got beaten in a prelim that year too, maybe by Brisbane up there, and and went pretty. They went pretty close to winning that game, and so you could sort of tell. And they were really young. I think I was one of the youngest lists on the, in the comp, and so that was a huge, um, huge factor in, in where I wanted to go. But it was also, yeah, there's just that that you know you could, and it, you know, having lived in Melbourne, you knew that Geelong was still just very much a regional town, and um. And that was definitely something that appealed to me. I, I just, I wanted to, I don't think Melbourne, I didn't, I didn't dislike living in Melbourne, but it just wasn't, I didn't feel like it was ever my sort of place. And um, I couldn't see myself living there long-term, you know, after footy or anything. And, but I, moved, I came down to Geelong and I just, I just felt like I knew, yeah, it was a small town and you could, you could drive 10 minutes and be in the, out in the country somewhere or down the beach. And um, yeah, that was definitely a, definitely a, um, yeah, a, a factor in, in deciding to want to come down here for sure. Yeah. So fast forward to your first year for Geelong and there was an infamous press conference. And I don't know um, if you remember, but Mark Bomber Thompson was subject to a bit of scrutiny related to you. And he came out to bat for you, uh, gave a bit of a, a scathing uh, <laughs> um <laughs> He had a go at the at the journos. What do you remember about that press conference and how did it feel to have your head coach come out to bat, bat for you at a time where you may not have felt um, like you were settling in the way you expected? Yeah, it, I, I remember it clearly. I I um I was doing it pretty. It was tough. It was a tough change. I I, I sort of probably knew that there was going to be a lot of scrutiny, but I, it was probably more. It was far more intense than I probably expected. Um, and I found that difficult. I was always one that didn't didn't really, you know, I had my own share of media and that sort of thing, but I didn't really always, I didn't particularly enjoy it. I didn't sort of seek it out or whatever, but it just felt like every time I'd hear anything that was talking about how I was going or, you know, how I wasn't doing certain things or, or whatever. And um, it was quite, it was early on in the year. So it was sort of, it was, some of it seemed a little bit unrealistic too, because it was just sort of like I'd, I hadn't even really started and people were sort of expecting me to, to be going better than what I was or whatever it was. I couldn't, I was, I couldn't really work it out, but um, yeah, I remember feeling like I was under a hell of a lot of pressure and, um, and I, and I wasn't probably wasn't handling it all that well. And I, I remember coming, I think it was against Destin and we played and, um, and I think I played okay that night. And I think maybe the question was asked about how, I don't know, it's just, I don't think I think Bomber just was waiting for an opportunity to 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 sort of fire to let both barrels go and and he and he um and he just yeah it was I remember I don't know the initial um emotion when I saw it I had took a while a couple of days for me to see that to see the press conference or whatever but um I remember being a little bit embarrassed thinking that he had to do that to you know, to sort of, he felt the need to have to do that because I sort of wished I, I wish I had been performing a little bit better so that he didn't have to be in that position, I guess. But, um, but yeah, also, you know, after, you know, I felt it just made me feel like he was, he was right behind me. So it was something like Bomber and I always got along reasonably well. We weren't, I wouldn't have said we were close, I guess, in, in, in comparison to probably my relation maybe with Spud, you know, as a, as a comparison, but he, he did, you know, he definitely made you feel, made me feel then that he was, you know, he was right behind me and, um, and he, and he wanted me to, he just wanted, he just maybe felt like it was a little bit unreasonable what I was, the sort of scrutiny that I was copying at that stage. And, um, and it definitely really helped me, you know, uh, you know, that emotional connection with him. And, um, and it felt like it took a little bit of the pressure off because I felt like he just, you know, he was in my corner and he was, he was there ready to back me in. And, um, and I felt like it, my footy turned around subsequently from that. So one of Bomber's great strengths was he's he was great at managing people and he had different relationships. He was close with some guys and he wasn't close with some of us, but he he had a, an ability to have a connection with us and get the best out of all of us. And that was something that I'll always 
love and respect him for because he he got definitely helped get the best out of me and that was a, that was the start of of a great working relationship with him and it really helped. Yeah, very good. Um, then fast forward to the next, the very next season. Not much of a fast forward. Uh, you take you take a bit of a leap, get over Darren Jolly. What mark of the year? How, if you can talk us through like the 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 moment, like when when you see Darren Jolly there and the ball coming in, do you immediately think like I oh, I'm going to go for this? I'm going to get up here, and then what's what happens in the immediate aftermath of it? Oh no, that, I mean that, I don't know. I didn't take heaps of big marks like that in my career, but I remember. But you, whenever you do, you, I think it's almost an element of surprise that you sort of come down and you. You know, it sort of happens without you even really thinking too much about it. But, um, yeah, I remember that game was – I'd come in at half time and I had maybe three, two or three possessions or something. I'd had a horrible night up until that point and, and Bomber had said something that made me well aware of what I wasn't doing right. And so I think he said something like, do, just do something. If you can do – just do something for the night or whatever and – um and then that that was not long after half time. So I guess I I guess I did something that night. In, in it that was game. something. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> um, we finished up losing the game, but I, I remember um yeah, I, I remember coming back to the next centre bounce and Darren Jolly set, was pumped a bit. It kept getting replayed on the on the big screen. It was up there at Olympic Stadium and Darren Jolly was kept looking at the screen, going, Oh geez, good on you. I know. Thanks, mate. I reckon I might might even be on a footy card this year by the looks of that or something. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on a on a poster or something. So um, we had a bit of a laugh about that. We both went went about it at the centre bounce straight after. But um, yeah, that was pretty. That was I don't know. It was it was a bit of a bit of a thrill. The mark of the year. Something it's pretty special. I was yeah something I um yeah yeah it was a bit of a it was a nice moment. Yeah, very very much. Um, the year after two thousand seven, the the elusive flag for Geelong did it. How did the build up of the year feel? Because the I'm pretty sure 2007 was the year you guys didn't start all that great, um, but then you obviously built up to it, and then going through finals. Can you just talk us a bit through that season and how it all felt, like especially getting then to get the prize at the end of the end of the road? Yeah, that was that was an amazing year. It was probably one of I don't know. It's one of my fondest years of you know memories of my footy career. Um, yeah, as you said, we started pretty poorly. I reckon we were like two and two and three or two and four or something, we'd just, we'd just been beaten by, and 06 was a really bad year for us. We, we had a, we had a pretty bit of a write off of a year. There was a lot expected of us as that young team that was going to emerging team that everyone expected us to do a lot better. Um, And we just, we had a really really bad year. We, we finished, I reckon we finished 13th or something. We'd had a, we'd had a shocking year. And, um, and so there was a fair bit of, expectation going into to 2007 bomber had nearly got sacked i think at the end of 06 there was a you know pretty intensive review and of, of the footy club and you know everyone's roles and uh, um so you know there was an expectation that it was 07 it, you know it was make or break sort of thing for a lot of a lot of people and you know we were two and whatever it was two and four and we'd been beaten by i think hawthorne and then Maybe North Melbourne at home, and um, and we had sat down. We'd been doing a lot of work with leading teams that year. Um, it was the the leadership sort of program that famously Sydney had used, and um, there was a few other clubs that had had great success through. And so we'd done a lot of work on leadership and you know culture and that sort of th- thing at the club, and um, and we'd made a lot of great inroads, but the year started pretty poorly, obviously, and. And we, I remember sitting around in the meeting room and there was players and coaches and, you know, we all had the chairs sort of facing in, sort of, t- you know, pretty honest session. And I remember there was some pretty honest, com- you know, communication and conversations had around, you know, personal things about players, you know, and, you know, pointing a few fingers. And um, I remember Kenny Hinckley was the was assistant coach at the time and he said, you guys need to appreciate and you, get, and you need to, understand how close you are and how good how good you are you're in a position where you you should be and you could be you know premiership contenders but you're just you're not playing for each other and you're not and and that was that was the theme of sort of a lot of that conversation was it was a you know it was a, probably a crisis meeting as much as you would want to call it blokes were just and people were saying you know we're not playing we're, we're being very selfish and we're we're not taught we're not 
living the values that we've been speaking about all pre-season. And, and, and I'll never forget Kenny just saying that because I remember sitting back thinking, oh, I never really ex- even considered that, that we would be in a position where we where we could be a premiership contender. You know, I'd sort of probably played for teams where I'd, I'd only played finals a couple of times or whatever. And, and I remember being a bit struck by that comment. But, um, you know, it was a, it was a pretty, I don't know, there was a, it was a bit of a watershed moment. We went, we, we went out and played Richmond the following week and won by a record margin. You know, we, we beat them by over 140 or 50 points or something. It was, you know, a, a huge win. And um, and it was almost like it just, the the shackles were broken and it's almost, almost the monkey was off the back. And I think we went on to win 16 straight or something after that. And, um, and we, but, and, you know, ironically, Port Adelaide beat us in round 22 at home, and that was the first time we'd been beaten for the rest of that season. And then we went into the the final series with a fair bit of confidence. And um, yeah, we just it was it was an amazing it was an amazing run. It was sort of you know I spoke before about Richmond and feeling that momentum of the of the fans and and the expectation of because of the lack of success. It was it was exactly the same with that year with with Geelong. It felt like just every week that we win. You know, coming off the the nineties where Geelong was so close but never could actually win a flag and you know, played in all those losing grand finals and you know, it had a lot of it had been a really successful team without having won premierships. It was something you could just feel the expectation of the town and the and the people and the even and around the club. It was I remember the the catch cry was sort of keep a lid on it and everyone was saying keep a you know, with everyone because the, the outside noise was, you know, Geelong's gonna go and is gonna win, no one can beat him and and they're too good for everyone else. And but you know, we were conscious of everyone just kept saying, just keep a lid on it. And you know, we've got to just get the job done. And yeah, as the as the season obviously got to the finals and with that expectation, there was a, I remember a huge amount of pressure. It was just no one spoke about it. No one we, it was just a it was sort of unspoken. But I just remember thinking, geez, it's gonna I just hope we can do this because it's a, a lot is being expected of of everyone just sort of expects us to win and um we snuck across the line against the Pies in the prelim in, in what was an amazing game, the biggest, the most loudest, loudest crowd and big. I think it was the biggest crowd I ever played in front of, and um, we beat them by five, five or six points, and and then obviously won the, the, the won the grand final by record margin the following week, and it was. I just remember the, um, you know that the feeling, just the the relief of winning that. Of winning the premiership because it was almost if we didn't win it, anything less than that was going to be a, a letdown after the the way the year had sort of progressed and you know it was just it was just expected probably towards the end that we were going to win and and um, I just remember being so relieved that we did in the end. So it was um, yeah, as I said, probably one of my I think it was probably the one of my favourite seasons of of my career and and feel really lucky to have to have been a, a part of such a historic part of of the club's of the club's history. Yeah. Of yeah. 100%. Obviously you mentioned keeping a lid on it and hindsight is an amazing thing, but after that 2007 grand final win and how big of a win it was, did you ever sit there and think, gee, we could be on for a few more here? Like, because obviously you won two more and you could have won even more than that. So what were your thoughts immediately after that grand final win? Yeah, I think, I think coming into, I mean, obviously you just enjoy the moment for, for as long as you can. You know, it was, it was, it was an amazing, amazing couple of months, really. You know, even going into probably Christmas time before, it was, it was amazing just time leading into the 08 season because you could just enjoy the that success together. And we definitely did that. It was it was really special, really amazing time for the club and the the town. Even it was it was amazing. People would. It was just a. It was really really special time. And um, yeah, I don't think you ever sit there and. And sort of look into the future and sort of size it up, thinking you're gonna you're gonna keep winning or whatever. But um, yeah, I think the way the way we were playing, I think we were probably pretty confident that we were going to be really hard to beat. And and there was definitely a sense of of um, of real confidence in the way we we played from then on for the next four or five years in particular. Obviously, um, yeah, I think we just knew that. Guys had sort of come into their, a lot of guys had come into their prime together, and so we were all playing. You know, it was a pretty consistent team that was going to stay together for for a bit longer after that. So, yeah, I think there was definitely an expectation that we were going to be able to keep keep you know achieving more success for sure. 
you 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 were able to play with a lot of talented players in your time at both Richmond and Geelong. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, but one of those has just retired himself. Uh, Joel Selwood comes into the club in 2007. What were your immediate thoughts of him and then sort of, I guess, how proud of you of what he was able to accomplish? Yeah, he was he was an amazing player. He, he was an amazing... I think my, my earliest memories are of just how... It was almost... I wouldn't say it was intimidating, but I was. it was almost just how blown away I was with how... how just good he was at everything. Like he was the sort of guy that, you know, he walked in and he, he didn't, he wasn't, he was never arrogant about it. He was never, he never had, um, you know, you never got, had the feeling that someone had to tell him to pull his head in, but he would, but he would just, he was happy to, if he saw something that he didn't, didn't think was right, he'd tell someone, you know, his training standards were as good as anyone on the list, probably better. He probably set the standard from the moment he walked in and, um, on and off the field, he, he just he was the sort of guy that just never, never put a foot wrong. So he sort of, he and he just drove drove a certain standard by his, his actions more than anyone I think I can probably ever ever remember in my time in playing footy. So, um, they, that was the sort of thing that stood out, and that was instant. You could sort of tell that was that was going to be the way he was going to be. That's the way he is. Like that's just his the way he is. It wasn't something that. He was making up, or he was. It wasn't something that was going to develop or change in him. It was just what he was, and that was. And instantly, that you know, when someone like someone like that comes along, you, you sort of it, it sets an expectation for everyone else, and that's probably could be one of his greatest strengths. I don't know that he just had the ability to make everyone realise, you know, set a standard that he lived by that he sort of expected everyone else to live by. So, you know, there's no surprise, and there's no there's no secret to the success that he's had, he's just been, he's had those standards throughout his whole career and he's worked really, really hard. And, um, you know, it, there's not many guys. I mean, Gaz, little Gaz Jr. was probably one that he did all the amazing things in his, in his career. And, you know, Joel and he's and Joel's sort of record were probably similar. And, you know, you feel really lucky to, to go through your, through your career playing alongside guys like that because they're, they're people who will be able, They'll have stands named after them, and they'll be, you know, they'll be remembered by the club as as some of the very best to have ever, ever played. And so to to play alongside guys like that makes you feel really fortunate. So, yeah, one of the things I will say about Joel is, you know, all the things that he did on the field. He's he's got some there's some amazing stories, and there's some stories that came out over in recent time over things that he does off the field. But for every one story you hear, there's a there's a hundred others that. That you that you don't hear about little things that he'll do to someone's to help someone's ch- child or you know he he do, he'll do things that he doesn't have to but he just does them because he's a good person and um and you know they're the things that I probably appreciate of him most of all because he's you know they're not things that he gets accolades for they're just the things he does because he's a good bloke so um yeah I feel really lucky to to have been able to share share the field with him and. And um and yeah, it was it's amazing to watch such an amazing career to career sort of play out and be a part of it in a little way. It was it was really special. Do you yeah, absolutely. Do you have any of those stories? Say so there's a hundred other stories from Joel. Do you have any really fond ones that you know you what you look especially looked back on when he was retiring or whatnot? Uh what well, there's I used to take Johnny, my little boy, into training occasionally because I I you know, I still work with the cats a little bit, so um there's a couple of times, yeah, just for me personally, I remember taking Johnny to training. I was sort of a bit hesitant because Johnny was still only little, but I thought, oh, he can come along. He's into his footy a bit. So I took him along. He sat in the, he sat, I sat him up in the stand with a water bottle and some food and stuff and said, just sit here and don't, just don't move. I'll, I've got to just, I'll be on the ground. You can see where I am. You can, you can just watch. And um, I finished up like, training, got to the stage of, there's a, yeah, you know, ten or fifteen minutes where I had the big the ruckman just doing a bit of try bit of time to to do a bit of few drills with them, and I was sort of doing a bit of ruck stuff and and looked over to where Johnny was just to make sure he was he was still in his seat and and he was gone. I thought, oh no, where's he? he's he's taken off. He's going to be out in the field somewhere. And I'm looking, scanning around, looking for him. And sure enough, he's out in the field. And I start running over to him, just getting ready to tell him off and tell him to get back to his seat. And I see that he's over mucking around with Joel. And 
Joel and and Tommy Hawkins as well. And and um, I get over there and I'm like, mate, Johnny, what are you doing? And Sal's like, no, nah, mate, I needed him out here. I needed him out here to kick the footies out to us. And so Joel had seen Johnny was in the in the stands and and he said he didn't and he didn't want him sitting there by himself. So training had sort of wound down and Hawk and Sal were kicking goals together and he and Joel went and grabbed Johnny and just to, to include him and and uh, to to get him get him part of the of training, he went and grabbed him and took him and had a kick with him and was kicked. So Johnny's kicking out with Hawk and Sal and and you could see how much it meant to a little kid and, and Joel Joel didn't have to. He, you know, he would have been easy, easier for him probably to leave leave Johnny in the in the stands and and uh, but instead he went and grabbed him and and took him and and had a kick with him. And Johnny still talks about it now. He never forget it. So that you know, there's that was one for me personally that he um you know something that he didn't have to do but he just did it anyway. And um yeah, there's I mean there's as I said there's a million stories of of guys you know he he'll he'll just he'll ring one of the boys out of the blue knowing that it's one of the kids birthdays and joel's on the phone or facetime and with kids and the kids no one expects him to do it but he just does it and, and the kids are blown away by it and you know joel just there's the sorts of things that he does all the time and it's um yeah i don't think they're only little things but i, 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 I think he maybe appreciates how much it means to people and yeah it's 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 pretty nice that he's able to and he's still willing to do that sort of stuff so obviously having been back at Geelong coaching, how much time did you have to take off footy and how did they sort of rope you back in? Uh, well, I basically just started. So it's a really part-time role what I have with the, with the club, with with the ruck coaching. And um, when I first finished, I did a little bit more. Actually, I was a couple of days a week. Um, and then games, I was sort of going to most games. And um, and so, yeah, that's that sort of started straight away as soon as I finished finished playing playing I started the coaching role so um it's a little bit different now I basically just spend a day a week down there with, with the main session that they do and a bit less game time a bit less time spent with obviously with kids and stuff so um yeah it's good though I, I enjoy just having an involvement still without um with that you know I, I was never a passionate coach I don't think that was ever my my passion or, or my path but you know to stay involved a little bit and particularly now as, I, as I'm a bit older I can probably feel like I can give a little bit more sort of, you know, a little bit more advice as sort of having been away from the game a little bit longer. So, um, yeah, no, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the, enjoy the connection. There's still a lot of mates that are working down there and stuff. So that's, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to stay involved a little bit. Yeah. Obviously moving from playing into that part-time role, you would have had some expectation of how it might've gone. Is there anything you learnt taking up that role um, that you can apply now? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's things that you learn as a coach that I guess you would have loved to have known as a player. Um, and a lot of that is more around for me was around, and, and maybe it was just a realization, you know, that, 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 you know, the mental side of footy was, was so much, I'd, I'd probably never put enough. I wish I had to put more time and, and effort into to sort of managing your own mental state, I guess, and um, the expectation and just the pressure that comes along with the pressure to perform. And um, they're all things that are, that you sort of, that you, you spend, I probably spend time now to chatting to guys more about that stuff than I do about the physical stuff, um, you know, because they're the things I felt like were the things that, that, uh, that limited me as much as anything. So, yeah, in, in hindsight, that's probably something that I've learned and, is that I, you know, I wish I had have done a little bit more, um, spent a bit more time on, you know, focusing on on dealing with that that stuff. So, and it, you know, it's I remember hearing Gene um, Syracuse say, you know, don't don't ever forget how hard the game was as a player. I think you know that's one of the things you do have as an insight as a as a coach, as you know. It's, you know, it's, it's easy just to watch a video and say, oh, "Why didn't you just jump here instead of there?" And all you know, but it's 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 a lot. It's a lot. It's very easy sitting back and watching. So it's you sort of do have to be conscious of that as a coach. And um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it gives you a little bit bit of an insight. And um, you, you, it's, it's easy to forget how hard it was as a player. So um, yeah, that's good insight to have, I guess. Very good. Yeah. Um... That's amazing. Oh, that was that was incredible for especially for us. I think that wraps up all the questions we have. 
We've got a few from our listeners that have been sending if Brando wants to do those. I would love Brando if you could start with good friend of the podcast, Jared Thomas. If I will good. start with him. So we posted on Twitter um, asking if anyone had questions for Brad Ottens. First up, Jared Thomas, he is a raging St. Kilda fan. <laughs> and he, he tweeted, I have one question. What did St. Kilda ever do to you, Brad? <laughs> oh, uh Oh, well, I I don't know. I guess there's there's teams that you sort of over your career, you sort of for some reason you have a reasonable record against, and um, yeah, Saints. I sort of had. I guess it was a bit a little bit up and down, but I guess the main one was the O9 Premiership. That was one that was that sticks out. <laughs> That'd be the out. one that sticks out in his head for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't remember that being a huge day for me personally. I um, you know, personally on as a performance um, perspective, but. Um, yeah, no, I think think you don't ever. There's no teams that I particularly disliked or whatever. It was just uh, one of those ones that Saints were tend to had a few good good games against them, I guess. And um, but yeah, I, I always enjoyed. There was a few pretty tough opponents playing against the Saints that you know playing against the Revolts and those sorts of guys were that was something that you sort of reflect on as you get older and think it's pretty cool. But um, no, I met. It was it was nice to that was the that Saints grand final was the toughest one toughest game I ever played in so that was they were a very formidable opponent over the years that's for sure they were a great football team for sure they were very much so um so on the other side of the spectrum you mentioned big performances uh we've got Scott Curtis who's a Geelong fan and he asked do you think the 2007 prelim was your best slash most important game and he also mentioned it was phenomenal uh. Oh, it's one I reflect on. Yeah, I, I probably feel like that was maybe my, my most complete game. I guess um, I felt like that was when I played. You know, you know, I was really lucky to be two thousand one. I was all Australian, but I felt like I felt like oh seven was maybe my most consistent season as a player, and um, just in the in the you know in my contribution to the team as much as anything. So yeah, that that game was, you know, it was so, it was, as I said, it was, I'll, I'll never forget the crowd running down the race and it was the loudest of ever, the, the crowd I ever heard. It was, it was unbelievable. Obviously played in four, four grand finals, but, but that premiership, that prelim, sorry, was, was, um, that was phenomenal. You know, obviously Collingwood, Collingwood Cats was, that was probably the start of a bit of a, a rivalry that, that game. And um, it was, yeah, it, I'll I'll never forget it, and the, and the, you know as the game wore on, it was just it was sort of up and down, and um, yeah, it could have gone either way, sort of even in the last couple of minutes, and um, yeah, I felt like yeah, I felt like I, I had a pretty significant contribution in that game, and that was something that yeah, it's one I'm one I'm definitely really proud of. So um, yeah, I'm I'm very very lucky, I feel feel very uh, um, oh, I was. I was very happy to fall across the line in that game. That's for sure. Cause it could have gone either way. So yeah, it was a pretty special night. That one. Does that kind of performance calm your nerves heading into a grand final? Obviously it was your first one. Um, how does that sort of performance carry over into the next week? Does it make you feel a little more confident? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, yeah, I think, I think it was definitely a scare for us. Cause it, you know, as I said earlier, you know, there was so much expectation that we were going to just win that premiership that, so that was almost, yeah, you know, it was almost like we were just floating along up until that point, and um, and so to to sneak across the line, you know, and you know Collingwood, it was it was yeah, it was literally a, a line ball game, and um, so yeah, to to to, to win and um, in a way that you know, and just to grind out a win like that was was definitely something that would definitely would have helped us going into the following week. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that yeah. 2007 grand final there, Brando, because that is a great segue to the next listener question. Um, is it? It is the Port Port Adelaide fan, Anthony. Alexander. It is. I didn't catch that little um that little thing you were doing there. We do have uh one of the Inner Sanctum's resident Port fans, Anthony Lesiani, who asks, "Have you come down from your market?" Obviously, that famous call from Anthony Hudson. Has he oh, come I down? <laughs> Yeah, oh, I definitely come down, mate. I can't jump at all these days, so it's, uh, <laughs> I definitely came down. Um, that's for sure. Oh, very good. Do you remember watching that um, that clip back and hearing the call? What were your thoughts on it when you first watched it back? 
Yeah, it was a it was a great call. I used to love Hutto's calling. He was he was um he'd get the big wind up and you know he was he was great. He was a great caller, I thought. So yeah, I thought he called that that awesome. It was good. It was good. Yeah, Very unbelievable. Good. I've got one last listener question who someone sent to one of my mates said to me, uh, Rory Sleeth asks, how you've got three flags, how, how are each of them different for are they, they're all obviously all obviously meaningful, but are they meaningful for different reasons in it by any chance? Yeah, definitely. They are. The, obviously the first one was, was so significant for everyone. Um, I mean, they're all significant, but um, yeah, the first one was pretty, was so special because it was, it was, um, it had been so long and we were all, all, it was the first time for us all um, feeling any of that, you know, experiencing any of that sort of success. So um, I think, you know, this, the Saints one, as I said, was a really tough, Was it was a bit of retribution after after losing 08 in a, in a year that we were probably, you know, expected to win as well. And um, so that was something that, that, you know, I think we all, we may not have won that, that year, if we, you know, that in particularly that game, if we had have won in 08. so that was that was really special for as a as a bit of a retribution for for what we couldn't achieve the year before, and um and 2011 was was special for me personally because it was my last game. I, you know, I, I retired after that game, and and Lingy, a great friend of mine, it was the same. He, you know, he and I both finished up at the same time, and um after having you know, and the, to be able to to be able to end a career. You know, with a winning grand final is a, is something that's a, it's a huge privilege or something I'll, I'll always appreciate. So, yeah, yeah, they're all they're they're all very special. Um, but yeah, I'll probably reflect on. All right, it's hard one. Oh seven and two thousand eleven. They're both they're both they're all they're all very special in different ways. Very good. Um, I guess that brings us to our quick fire questions part of it. I got I got six questions for you. A lot of these are questions that we do in our introduction when we all join the inner sanctum. So we've just sort of condensed that down to a bit, and just sort of, uh, I guess, one sentence or one uh, one word answers if you if you want. There's nothing too strenuous about it. Just nice and fun. Uh, I'll start off with what is your favourite TV show? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Very good. Favourite movie of all time? Uh, oh, um. Wedding crashes up there, I reckon. <laughs> very good. I love very that. good. I love very that. good choice. Uh, your go to karaoke song? Uh, the Gambler, Kenny Rogers. Oh, very good. A, very good very choice. Good. Um, your thoughts on Tom DeConning? Uh, <laughs> very, I love Tom DeConning. <laughs> yeah, Brito's, oh, fa- Brito's favorite player. Just uh, uh, no, I love him. I love Tom DeConning. Very good. That's very what we like good. to hear. Um, your hardest player to play against? <laughs> Um, Dean Cox was was one that he was um he was a very good player. He was he was a bit too good for me. I yeah. think he got good a hold man. of me. Very so good he, man. He ran way too good, way too well as a 200, 200 centimeter bloke shouldn't be able to run like he did. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh gosh! And the arguably the most important and controversial one. What is your favorite flavor of shapes? Uh, it's a good question. It is an important question, isn't it? it uh, is. I think the original pizza shapes is the oh. uh, is my favourite. Okay. Some, some of the people at the Inner Sanctum will love that, but me some and Jacko do we, not love we that. Are, we do not love that, but some of the people will be very happy with that answer. What's um, you chicken, chicken or? I'm a barbecue man. We're both barbecue men. Yeah, we're barbecue men. Uh, yeah, but there is, there is a nice even split at the Inner there Sanctum. Is, Everyone, there is a... Everyone's in different corners. So a few, well, a few of them will love you for the same uh, pizza. There's a, there's good. a, sh- for everyone these days, there's all sorts of different flavors. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Some of those ones like savory are just for anyone who likes that. Savory is not a good flavor of shapes. Jenna, <laughs> um, we've come up to our final segment, uh, the hard tag quiz. I'm going to pit you and Brando up against each other. Uh, it's the best of three, so I'm going to ask a question, and it'll go to you first, Brad, and then you'll both get a chance to answer. Then the second one obviously will flip, and then but best of three wins. So, Brad, um, you kicked a lot. You kicked 261 goals in your career. Who did you kick your first against? Uh, gee, that's a good question. Uh, Geelong? Geelong. Brando, who do you think he kicked his first against? Well, I wasn't born in 1998. I assume it was that year. So <laughs> let, let's have a think about this. <laughs> let me approach this. <laughs> um, 
look, it could be any of the other 15 teams at the time. So you know I what? will go with, you know what? I'll go with Carlton. Okay, sweet. I was going to say, don't go Gold Coast. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was Geelong. It was round two, second game yeah. against Geelong. Yeah. Um, if ne- neither of you guessed it right in that one, I was going to give a minor hint, but he's absolutely nailed it. So that is one one nil to Brad so far. So Brando, I'll start. This is this second one is going to be who gets closest. Um, obviously Ruckman, they're great. One of their favorite uh, positions on the ground. Their main job is one thing: win the con- win the ruck contest. What is the most amount of hitouts that Brad had in a game, Brando? All right. Um, let me think of what a top end number is. Probably somewhere between. 50 and 70. We'll go 52. 52 oh. for Brando. Brad, what do you reckon? Far Have I nailed that? Brando, I reckon you've got a bit over the odds there. I oh, maybe no. 42, maybe. The correct answer is 40. Oh. Oh. Killed her in 2004. So it's still, a, it's still a hefty total, to be fair. It's, a, it's not a small amount of hitouts. It's way more no. than I've ever gotten in a game. <laughs> I think I don't even have that. I've never had that many touches in a game. I think I was just thinking about the top end of like guys like Brody Grundy, Jared Witts, <laughs> the top end game. of what they've gotten. Different, different game, game back now. then. Different game I'll, back then. I'll different take game. it. 50, 50 would have been nice, mate. I would have taken <laughs> Oh, So Brad's won 2 nil with the, in the best of three. But our last question, um, you've had some time off in the 2009 season, Brad. You missed a, missed a fair chunk of footy there. How many games did you play in 2009? Uh, I played... I played about five, I think. Five. Oh, and... five. Yeah. Brando, Brando for right. the, I, I can snag a sweep. point here because if you it's can. higher, I can say six and snag a point. So I'm going to go six. <laughs> <laughs> he's locked in six to the, on that tactic, but he's got it spot on with six. Oh, well done. As Come well, on. I'm pretty sure it's, yeah, you played one and two, one, two and then 22 uh, and then the three finals. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. very good. Um, that is so, genius for me. I should do that every week. Just try and <laughs> it, it is. But unfortunately, you've we've gone down, Brenda. You've you've put us one uh, down zero one in the the host versus guest competition. Um, anyway, that wraps us up for today. Thank you very much, Brad, for joining us today. It's been incredible to chat to all you. Right. I know I've loved it. No worries at all, boys. I've really enjoyed it. Always good to talk about yourself for a while. (laughs) I'm sure it is. Um, Anyway, that wraps up the very first episode of the Hard Tag podcast. Um, If you're listening on Spotify, we are over on YouTube. uh, Vice versa, if you're on YouTube, we are over on Spotify and all good podcasting platforms. You can hit hit us up on socials at the Hard Tag Pod or at Hard Tag Pod, sorry. And we will be back next week with another with another big guest. Thank you, thank you all for joining me. Thank you.